Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Endurance School, and thank you for uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Today, we are so excited to be talking to Coley Moore of Empirical Cycling and the Empirical Cycling Podcast. Coley coaches professional, elite, and amateur athletes of all disciplines and at all levels. He's consulted for World Tour teams, World Championships, or sorry, World Champions, national team coaches, and is part of the WKO development group that creates and tests new and advanced cycling analytics. Uh, Kyle and his co-host, uh, Coley and his co-host Kyle launched the Empirical Cycling Podcast in March of 2019 and just passed 100,000 downloads in October. Uh, the podcast blends hardcore physiology with sensible training advice and seems to have found a dedicated audience in the cycling community. Uh, away from coaching, uh, Coley is a medalist at the U.S. Cycling National Championships, a former Taekwondo instructor and competitor, and got his B.S. in biochemistry from Boston University. I got oh. biology, not biochemistry. Biology, sorry. Different. Um, I, said, I studied biochemistry pretty intensively there, but <laughs> uh, close enough, yeah. <laughs> uh, Coley, welcome to detention. Thank you for giving me detention. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually our first question for everybody, um, and the way that we have to kick off all, kick off all of these. Is this your first time in detention? Tell us about your middle school detention experience. Have you were you the kid who like never got in trouble or like yeah? I tell think, us more. I think one of my friends once convinced me to skip class with him, and I did because uh, you know you know some of the other miscreant kids did that too mm -hmm. uh, and then the teacher obviously noticed and I got uh, internal suspension um, oh wait was that for something else <laughs> uh, no I, I, I got in trouble like like a little bit but I, I was uh, I was just pretty straight laced for the most part you're in good I company <laughs> I got in trouble later I saved that for you know, when I was 20. Awesome. Got it. Yeah, you're, um, uh, yeah, M Molly and I are very often like, oh, our guests are, did not have our middle and high school experiences. We were like the bad kids. <laughs> oh, you guys were the bad kids? Yeah, we were, yeah apparently, because <laughs> every guest we have are, is like, no, we didn't really get to spend much time in detention. Um, I was busy and, playing sports. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I spent 45 days in detention in seventh grade. Wow. I know. Yeah, it was intense. Were you um, going for a record or something like that? Competing with somebody? Um, yeah, it, was, it just wasn't a good year. You know? <laughs> it, was, it was a tough one. Um, speaking of difficult years, uh, you know, this, uh, this whole thing we're doing, the Endurance School, uh, has been basically part of our COVID-19 project um, as a way to stay engaged with athletes and do everything like that. Um, what has this year sort of made room for you to work on? Not much, actually. It's it's actually uh, because of the, for me personally, because of the, the additional stress, like when everything started locking down, like I immediately thought, I'm going to lose half my client base or more. Um, and I, I didn't. It grew, which was great because everybody, um, you know, uh, I think cyclists especially for some reason are very internally motivated. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people who think that racing kind of gets in the way of training sometimes. And we're very happy to just keep training. And a lot of people made a lot of great progress. And, you know, other people didn't make some progress and, and you know, learned a couple of things. But it's been, um, yeah, I didn't, uh, you know, we did the VX Max series. That was really intense um, for, for me to do the research. But I, I had the time to do it. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I'm also the, uh, the ECCC um, uh, conference director, so the Eastern Collegiate Cycling Conference. And so we had no racing. Um, sorry, college folks out there in the Northeast. Uh, I had to cancel everything, obviously. Uh, so that freed up a lot of weekends. But you know, a lot of it was just spent being stressed out. Um, and I think a lot of people, a lot, a lot of athletes share that same experience, too. So yeah. Have you had to do any additional management of the ECCC like, since everything has been canceled? Like, what has that been like about trying to talk to those athletes and kind of communicate like is like are they still gonna have a sport at some point? Well, no, I mean in the in the northeast everybody's actually pretty chill about it because um, uh, you know our our um, local governments uh, each C goes from it's like Delaware, uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and then like to the northeast. Um, that's us, and uh, 
you know, our, our local governments are taking everything pretty seriously, and the schools especially too. So very few teens can travel or do anything, or even like be in a group with a cycling related kit on. So they were like, yeah, we get it. We can't, we can't attend. So why would you hold this thing? <laughs> you know, where you know one team's going to show up. Um, so yeah, they've they've been okay with it, but mostly it's been you know dealing with uh, USA Cycling internally. Uh, which we don't have to get into right now. <laughs> <laughs> I am happy to uh, to divert the the conversation to your podcast. Um, you just hit a hundred thousand downloads, which is pretty incredible. Um, congratulations on that, first off. Uh, Thank you. And what does that number mean to you? What does that signify for you and your show? Um, I mean, it doesn't change much really because you know we're we're still you know o- getting only like you know, two to 4,000 listens an episode, um, which is pretty respectable, I think, for, uh, you know, a couple of, you know, just a couple of guys uh, <laughs> just talking about, you know, uh, lactate and whatever else. Um, but, I mean, I, it's, it was one of those things where I was like, this is a reason to celebrate, but it didn't, like, it, do, it didn't resonate with me personally because I, you know, none of that kind of stuff does. So I'm, just, I'm just not wired like that. Um, but I was like, this is a good, it's a good reason to do an uh, audience, um, you know, listeners question episode, which I, which I really, really enjoy. So I'm always looking for an excuse to do one of those. Yeah, the, uh, the, we've tried to do a few mailbag episodes and we're just, our, our like listenership isn't quite wide enough yet. And so, uh, yeah, we sort of end up being like, uh, all right, Molly, what are we going to talk about tonight? Right. <laughs> Chris, what do you um, have for breakfast? <laughs> right, yeah. Tell, why don't you tell me about your training? Um, so you launched the show in March of 2019. Um, what led to that decision? Why did you decide that that was something that you wanted to do or thought was a good decision? I was making just barely enough with coaching to pay my bills, but I wouldn't have anything on top of that for like taxes or like, you know, fun things to do. Um, so I was, uh, I was working as a carpenter um, pretty much full time uh, up here in Boston, which I've been doing since I was 18 as a side gig uh, on and off and mostly on for the last you know 15 years. Um, and, uh, you know, I was coming home tired, sore every night, and I was just grumpy, and I hated it, and uh, I just didn't want to do it anymore. Because I was always, I was always, it was always like a side gig. I didn't ever want to do that for the rest of my life, um, and, uh, and I was just miserable. And I was like, all right, just eat and pray. I'm gonna <laughs> like sit, like make a podcast, just send it out to the ether. Because um, I had written a couple uh, articles before that, and um, and I had been contacted by some people who were like, yeah, we. We want to hear what you need. Want to you know what you need to say about this that, and the other thing, uh, and you know I had done some consultations and stuff, and uh, I I was told that I had a, a unique understanding, and I was like, well, if this is true, people might listen to it, and if it's not, they won't, and I'll just be embarrassed um, <laughs> by putting out something that everybody listens to and goes, Ugh, and then turns it off, and that that's, and I was like, yeah, I can I can suffer that if it happens. But, uh, yeah, it was just it was just like hoping to you know put something out there where people would go, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. I think I can hire him to coach me. Um, it's, it's worked out pretty well. <laughs> What's something that you ran into uh, in the podcast creation process or like the production process that you weren't expecting? What's something that that you were like, oh, okay, this isn't what I thought was going to be. <laughs> oh yeah, we we recorded the first episode like three times before the episode that actually went out. Um, because we didn't know how to structure it. We just started by talking and we got way off, like we couldn't like focus. Um, and so, uh, so what we did was we started like writing a Google doc as an outline, uh, and then following that and they gradually got more and more and more detailed. <laughs> so, so at one point, I think the longest one that we've done is like 10 pages of like just an outline. Um, I think that might've been one of the VHMAX max uh, episodes. Um, and so yeah, we, we pretty much read from that, but like kind of riff and um, yeah, that's uh, that was one of the things that I that was the hardest to to do was like get used to pacing the show in a way that made sense given the things that we're talking about because it's not just like you know hey how you doing what's what's going on today Kyle <laughs> it's um 
yeah, yeah like having having that logic flow and have and be able to have an audience understand it. Um, that's that's been the, the most difficult part of what we're doing. I think. Um, Okay. I was going to say, I think you could really easily have a product in the notes for the VO2 Max uh, episodes in like some kind of like VO2 Max compendium, <laughs> like <laughs> something that people can read along in their books. <laughs> it's a great. I, I really had thought about publishing the notes, but, um, but once in a while, like one of us will, you know, write like a dirty joke in the notes. <laughs> totally. Just, and, and I'm like, ah, oh, we can't, <laughs> we can't do that. Or, or it'll like have like, how you know one of us actually feels about a thing <laughs> with lots of curse words and this person this that and the other thing uh and it's like yeah we can't we can't put that out there um which you know it's just, it's just for fun we don't we don't really mean it but well, yeah and it, it would put you in the place of like having to not only edit the show but then also edit the like creation documents and the, yeah. there's, oh, just, so, there's so much extra work, work and i i, I you know, honestly, like if if, if there's software out there where, where like it could just be transcripted, that would be great. Um, but you know, shoot me an email anybody out there if you know something like that, where I can just hit a button and it will shoot out a script and I can go in and you know edit the biochemical terms and make sure they're right and spelled correctly, and then that'd be cool. But yeah, it's it's so much extra work, and uh, I don't want to do that much work. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Um, we just from when we were chatting before we went live, you have a background in audio engineering. Um, does that background um, feed into the way that you think about structuring and making a show? Uh, not really. Uh, mostly it feeds into um, uh, the production of the show itself. I mean, I have a I forget what microphone model this is. Um, it was it was one of the ones that I used for voiceover when I was an engineer. S M seven B. That's it. Um, and, and I was, I was like, like oh, okay, so I need a good mic, I can do an okay audio converter, and I, and I, I just need some free software, and so I just use GarageBand, um, because it's not destructive editing, and, um, yeah, that's it, it's, um, that, that's really all, all it comes down to, people listen to it and they go, wow, this doesn't sound awful, that's, <laughs> that's the only thing where it really, really shows up. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things I noticed right away was just how just how good it sounds, and that is it's just so important. You know, there's too many podcasts out there. It sounds you know tinny audio and there's terrible background noise, and people don't monitor their breathing, and yeah, it's a nightmare. Yeah, yeah anybody out there who's doing a podcast, um, the secret is compression and a lot of it, a whole lot of compression. <laughs> Like, like if, 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 if I see the, the meter go, like when somebody's speaking, go anywhere below like the red, I'm like, oh, I gotta turn this up. I'm adjusting our audio controls right now. <laughs> Just to be but, but, but I've got a mastering limiter on it too, so it's not gonna like clip or anything. Okay. <laughs> um, so kind of, I kind of want to get back to that. Like you had mentioned that um, a few people had said, like, all right, you have this unique understanding about, you know, either FTP testing or the you're training too hard for criteriums, like those articles that you put out. Um, could you? I know this is like one of those things. This question is like, could you summarize your life? Um, but um, how did you arrive there? If you could kind of give us an overview of your coaching development, I think that would be really cool. Oh sure. Um... I mean, I've, I've, I've always been really fascinated by how and why things work, um, but, you know, like mechanical things, like, 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 like I used to really want to get into cars when I was young, and then when I realized how much they cost and how much money I was going to be making as a musician, I had to, like, oh, God, i got to not do that for a while. Um, and, uh, yeah, like, how things work has always fascinated me, like, how, you know, when I breathe in, what's happening? You know, when I eat this food, what's happening? When, um, when I go to sleep, what's happening? Um you know, how, how and why of everything uh, fascinates me. And, you know, I, I, it was always kind of like the back of my mind. And so after not making it as an audio engineer and uh, a rock musician, um, I, uh, you know, I kind of swung my wheels as a carpenter for a little while. And then, uh, and then one day I was like, I feel my brain getting stupid. Like, it's, like, the muscle is not there anymore. So I started reading uh, pop science books. And then I started reading, like, really intense pop science books, like, like, like how the mind works and stuff like that. And, like, uh, 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 oh, the other guy, I forget his name. Anyway, um, and so from there, I was like, I think I want to 
go to science. science. I want to be a best scientist. That would be the awesomest thing in the world. Uh, and so I applied to, uh, to Boston University to go to their um, to go to their Metropolitan School, which is their evening uh, continuing education program. Um, and they said, you know, you've got to do. Uh, yeah, these are your, you've already got a bachelor's degree. I have one from in music production from 2004. Uh, and they were like, all right, so you just have to take these classes. And I did. And like, as I was going, I was finding out like, oh, that's a question I've had since I was four. Oh, now I know why that and this. And it was like the world just opened up to me. Um, and while I was doing that, I was also, uh, you know, like everybody, I rode my bike a little bit. But I uh, started commuting, and then I decided one day on a commute when I was passing somebody, I was like, I want to race bikes. That sounds awesome. And so I did that. And then, like my my bike racing with um, with learning, you know, the the really detailed metabolic pathways all happened at the same time. So it was this really nice confluence of everything. Um, and you know, while I was going to class, um, I had to fight to get into <laughs> to get into biochem too, because um, it was not normally a class you know associated with the biology major. But I was so into it, I was I, I was like, can I please do this? It was at like nine o'clock in the morning, like Tuesdays and Thursdays, like not a usual night school time. Um, and it was with uh, Hans Kornberg, who uh, worked with uh, the Hans Krebs. Like I, I still have I have books by them. Like. There you go. Awesome. Krebs and Kornberg. Oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> Energy transformations and living matter. I read it every once in a while because it's it's so it's so so beautiful. Uh, it's, it's a lot of that stuff really still holds up today despite the advances and everything. That's like the foundations of modern biochemistry. And that's the kind of stuff I was learning while I was on the bike. And I'm like, oh, so right now I'm using carbohydrates or fat or what's happening. So I started with like like, like, you know, the, the, the ground floors, ground floors, ground floor of exercise physiology. And I got to like build up into my understanding of exercise physiology from my understanding of biochemistry, hmm. where I think a lot of people who just go to school for exercise physiology, you know, they get some of these classes, but, you know, um, you know, it's not their entire focus. Their entire focus is like, you know, the emergent phenomenon that we, um, you know, that we, uh, you know, can, you know, breathe out or, you know, lactate in the blood or something like that and interpreting those. And, you know, my understanding was a couple levels below that. And that, that's where I think, um, you know, that, that's, that was my development, like, really as a coach is, you know, learning, oh, wow, so if this, that, and the other thing, then if we do this on the bike, it should affect this. Uh, and, and like, like everything just started falling, falling together. And now, of course, you know, I'm at, I'm at that, that point, I, I, I think, I like to think, off the Dunning-Kruger curve. Kruger? Kruger? Um, <laughs> Never say it out loud. <laughs> like, like, I'm, at, I'm at the bottom where I feel like I know absolutely nothing, and there's so much more to learn up there, and I'll, I'll never get there. So. Yep. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's, yeah. my, that's my that's my development as a, as a coach with, uh, with science. Uh, when did the when did you and WKO kind of when did you come together with that with that sort of uh, software and how did that happen? Oh, I was um, I heard about that software because I didn't use WKO three uh, or three plus, but when four came out, I thought, oh, that looks really cool. I should. You know, it was like 180 bucks at the time. I was like, wow, that's, that's a lot of money. <laughs> but I was like, all right, I'm just going to do this. And uh, and so I got it, and I started playing around with it. And uh, at the time, you know, compared to what, what it is now, it was pretty crude, but there's still a lot of cool stuff that you can do. And so I was writing a blog that is now gone. Um, and uh, what, what happened after that? Um I think it got linked somewhere because uh, I think Tim at the time was just searching like the VK04, and I was like, this you know like you know scientists, I was like, this version you know one six three of the VK04 like um, was this this is what this analysis was done with and, you know in case the algorithm changes and you know I mean these people have a reference for oh it was this version of this thing um, like like a regular scientist and so. 
so I think that got shared somewhere or something like that. And then I discovered the Facebook group. And so I joined the Facebook group. And it was really small. It was like a couple hundred people, maybe, of that. Because uh, it was just brand new. It was like just getting out there with the product launch. And I started posting in there. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's, that's basically where Tim found me. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, he, uh, he asked, asked me to, um, you know, at one point they were asking, like, you know, does anybody want to do, like, articles uh, with, you know, using WKO4? Uh, and then, um, you know, Tim asked me to do a webinar, or he asked if anybody wants to do a webinar. And I was like, I'll do a webinar, yeah. Um, and, you know, I've, I was at the time, you know, transitioning to just being nothing but a sprinter. And, you know, I guess, uh, I guess my sprint stuff, um, you, know, you know, impressed him enough that he was like, like you, you want to do a webinar on sprinting? sprinting? I was like, yeah, yeah I, I do, of course. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I did, and then that was really the start of it, because at the time I had to, I had to work with one of our church geniuses, William Renfro, um, and I was like, Bill, this is what I want to do with this chart, and it, it, it ended up being the force velocity graph. <laughs> and, um, you know, that, that, that was that was a lot of fun too. That was the first time that I realized that like, oh yeah, there's actually we can mine data, not really mine data, but like we can we can have better physiologic insight than we think we can with just by looking at like average power and cadence and stuff like that. Um, and so that that's where it all started. And then you know, then from there they were like, hey, you want to consult with us on training impact, impact score? score? And I was like, yes. <laughs> he was like, pay is crap. And I'm like, it's great, it's fine. Let's do this. Um, it's keeping, yeah, it's so, keeping me safe from carpentry. <laughs> right. Uh, not, not at that point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah I, that, that was that was the hope. Um, yeah. So and so that that led me to getting a little more confident in knowing what I was talking about. And even then, I still I still don't feel like I know what I'm talking about. There's so much research that goes into like one statement on the podcast. Yeah. I, so, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> So you have had a lot of, uh, of different pathways, I guess, that have led you to, to where you are now. Um, who are the people who have been consistent mentors for you through, through any of those lines, either now and in physiology and coaching, or who have you brought with you along the way? Oh, God. Um, well, Kyle, obviously. Um, you know, Kyle kicked my ass up a hill in like 2013 or 14 for like 30 second place in an ECCC race, and we've been friends ever since. Because, you know, we were, we were like, looking, looking at each, each other. It was like me and him and like one guy from UMass. And, you know, we're like, it's like, like the final hill's coming up. We're all lying to each other. Like, I'm going to beat this guy. I'm going to beat this guy. <laughs> and Kyle like, like rides away doing exactly what I thought I was going to do. <laughs> He'll be behind him like panting. I'm like, that was amazing. <laughs> uh, I mean, we've been friends ever since. Um, and yeah, yeah, Kyle, Kyle is, is uh, you know, one of, the, one of the best people I've ever known. And he's... Yeah, yeah, he's, he's been, been he's been a great, great sounding board, board for everything. Because if I think I know something, I can explain it to him, and he can tell me why it's dumb or like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, maybe you got something. Um, uh, so, so him, um, you know, through the video, uh, obviously Tim Husick, um has been has been really really great. Without him, I probably wouldn't you know be anywhere right now. Um, and Dean Gollich, who I don't know where he went. Uh, he was uh, he was we were in regular contact for a while, but. Uh, going through Dean's stuff, um, you know, there's there's one like Training Geeks webinar from Dean from like forever ago, and it's still on YouTube. I highly recommend anybody watch it. Uh, I think it's um, you know something like modeling and you know coaching something interpretations. I forget the title of it, but it, that, it's a really good watch. And I watch it every like maybe once a year or so. Um, just because there's, there's always another thing that pops out at me. Um, yes, yeah, so Tim, Tim, Dean, Kyle, and um, Oh, there's, I just had, there's one, one more person, person and I'm so, I'm going to be so apologetic to them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <yeah. laughs> I remember that. Um, yeah, yeah, my bad. bad. It'll, uh, it'll come, come back, back as soon as we, as soon as we ask, ask the next question, it'll come back, back anytime. Time. It, no, and then we can, we can just come back to that. Um, um, what what do you th what do you think is the reason that the show has uh, had the success that it's had? Well, I don't know if it's had that much success. I mean, there are certain podcasts that have you know twenty thousand or more downloads per episode, um, which is funny because when I listen to those, I can't listen for more than like five minutes without cringing at something that's physiologically 
in, inaccurate or just flat wrong. It's just, oh, 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 God, not again. I got to stop listening to this. Um, but, you know, but, you know, they get it, they do it good enough that it, it you know, helps a lot of people you know, with their training. And that's fine. And that's I have no problems with that at all. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, so I don't think it's that successful, really, <laughs> compared to stuff like that. I mean, it's 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 successful enough in that I can be a full time coach now. Mm-hmm. And, and that's that's really like the most wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. So in, in that in that vein, it's been very much a success. Let me, uh, I'll take another, I'll take another pass at that question then. Cause right. I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm so interested. <laughs> I think um, I biffed it. I'm sorry. No, 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 not, no, uh, no. I think you answered it. I think you, I think I, uh, I asked it poorly um, because like clearly it has spoken to a, a number of people. And so I guess my question is like, um, what, what do you, what hole do you feel like you're sort of filling for those people that they're not finding elsewhere? Oh, I think it's this, like the people who feel the same way I do about training, like the, the why people, you know, the mm-hmm. annoying people, like <laughs> the why this, why that mom, dad. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I, I, th- I think that's, that's where it comes from because, um, you know, I think, I think a lot of the time in, in cycling training, um, you know, you get told a certain thing yields a certain result. And a lot of the time, you know, we find that it's not that easy. And knowing, you know, the deeper things under that uh, can really help make training decisions. Um, And so, you know, it's not for the people who just want a can training plan. And, you know, all right, can I can I do like a couch to 10k? Or, you know, something like that, um, you know, without thinking about it too much, because, you know, some of my friends are, are casual athletes, and they ask me, they ask me training advice. And it usually ends up, they are regretting they asked me training advice because <laughs> I have a hard time making anything simple until, you know, until I really, really understand it. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, th- I think that's, that's what it fills in is people who just, you know, why? <laughs> it's funny that you say that because I think one of the things that that I find about the show is that you do a very good job of explaining like deeply complex ideas in a fairly constrained amount of time. Um, and I, and that, that, that was one of my big questions was like, how does this guy do this? I don't know. It took eight hours to explain VO2 max. <laughs> and, and the next series that I'm, that I'm just gearing up to work on is, is going to be on, uh, I think it's going to be on uh, the basics of metabolism um, and how, and, you know, hopefully trying to make every episode apply to something but i don't think we're going to be able to do that you know like it's because you know the electron transport chain like there's you know it's going to take a little while to explain and it's going to be necessary to understand everything else but i don't know if i can make that relate to regular training and bike racing (laughs) well i'll do the best i can um what was the question i'm sure i'm not sure i answered it (laughs) Well, I mean, like, I, I think, you know, for as complex as VO2 max is like six episodes is like pretty good. Like that was a pretty good uh, compression. Um, but I, I don't know, I find myself understanding what you're saying pretty quickly and that's not easy. And like, I'm just, I'm interested in how you develop that skill or where that background came from. Oh, I mean, I think, I think anybody who's ever been in academia for, you know, a little while, and can tell you that the best way to understand something yourself is to explain it to someone else. Cause it really makes you question, Oh, do I actually know this? Or did I just like read it in a magazine and I should probably chase it down. Um, that that's really what I, what I think um, it comes down to is, you know, a lot of the times actually I've written entire podcast episodes cause I wanted to do research on something. And now that's, that's pretty much what it is. Um, where I'm like, man, I, I really want to dig into this thing and um, and I and I had always wanted to dig into v, the VO2 max intervals because they had been you know somebody had I, I didn't invent like high cadence VO2 max intervals like not by a long shot but um, you know they were told to me like oh this is going to reduce muscle damage and it's going to do this and that and the other thing and I was like I'm not sure that's that's exactly why it works and I seriously started the VO2 max series like looking to get to there without knowing if I was actually going to have anything concrete at the end. 
I think that's one of the things that um, that certainly resonated with me, I know has resonated with Chris, and I think resonates with a lot of people, is that there are so many things that are out there in the endurance world about, you know, just the, the truths that have become truth because, like you said in one of your podcasts, because everybody says them. Um, and I think you guys do a great job of, of drilling down to, like, the actual reality um, that those truths are based on. Um, or, if they're not true, um, dispelling a lot of, of myths. Um, can you tell us what you, like, if you could get rid of any of the, like, <laughs> myths that are out there in endur the endurance training world, what would you attack first? <laughs> Oh God. Uh, I, I've spent so long, you know, kind of trying to confirm or debunk things in my own head that I don't even know what training myths are anymore. If you give me a couple, I can, I can tell you if like, which one I'd, I'd rather, you know, shoot down first, uh, or if it's a myth at all. So one of the ones that I loved was um, I just started over again recently also. So like I just listened to the the FTP conversations at the beginning. And one of the things that you guys get into is the idea, like the American worth that work ethic, that oh, if you yeah. just work as hard as you can, that you're going to get better. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the, you know, in a way that's true, but in a way that's like horribly not true. Um, because I, I think that's, you know, what a lot of uh, average athletes just want to do is just like feel like they got to work out in and not that there's nothing wrong with that at all. But when you're really trying to, you know, become, you know, the best athlete you can be, you know, you really have to figure out how to get the most bang for the buck. And, you know, as you know, you, you guys as coaches, you know, as well as anybody who, uh, you know, other coaches or athletes who are very serious that fatigue and recovery are uh, as big a part of it as the training. Um, Cause uh, you know, if somebody is like, you know, training too hard or they're, they're too stressed or they're not getting enough sleep or whatever it is, like they're not going to recover. And that's, that's really going to screw you in the long run. And yeah, I think, I think if, I think if we've done an okay job kind of saying that that's like not the best thing to do to feel wrecked after every workout, I did a consult for one guy where that was literally what he was doing. And he was, he was very, very experienced cyclist. And I was like, if you take a week off the bike, you're going to feel so good. <laughs> and I'm still not sure he has. <laughs> um, but, you know, in other ways, like, um, like with just regular volume training, um, just, you know, packing on the miles, even if they're kind of easy, like that is one thing where you can just do a lot of work. And a lot of people, if they did more, would probably be faster cyclists in general. Um, so that's one of the places where doing more work can be good, but it's not one of those things where you need to be dead at the end to have it be really, really effective. And in fact, you know, if you're not dead, then you can do more tomorrow and that's gonna be even better. So as someone who has really dug into research um, and tried to find good source material, do you have recommendations for athletes who are doing the same and not sure how reliable their, their source material is? No, <laughs> I mean, cause, uh, cause there's a lot of excellent studies published and there's a lot of studies that, you know, I wouldn't qualify them as excellent, but are perhaps missing some puzzle pieces that, you know, I, and, you know, I, I think I, you know, I'm not going to fault them for that at all, because I think if I were in academia right now doing this research, I would be in the same boat as them. I have the luxury of a lot of time, um, you know, between, writing workouts and, you know, talking to athletes and stuff like that, where I get to just read anything I want. And I've been doing that, you know, as, as long as I can remember. Um, and so I just, you know, I get to, I get to really dig into things and find out the why of everything where, you know, a lot of uh, academics and the people who are doing research, they have to spend so much more time in the lab. Like it's a, it's a real full-time or full-time more than full-time job. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so it's, it's really difficult to separate the really excellent studies from the studies that leave something to be desired. Like, oh, I wish they had looked at this, or I wish they had known about this threshold or, you know, that this protocol, you know, biases things in this way. Like sometimes even like studies that look at MLSS, 
um, just their protocol for finding MLSS is like, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to do this protocol. And if we still find that this isn't quite there, we're going to use the higher one. But even then it's like, you still got to go higher than that. Um, and so it, it can like underestimate and that really skews the data. So it, I mean, it can happen with, with most studies and, um, um, there are a few excellent scientists out there. Um, but, um, you know, I, I would say for the most part, uh, you cannot go wrong with anybody um, who who is uh, academically related to like Ed Coyle or um, uh, Walter Herzog or uh, Keith Barr um, and, um, you know, John Halsey, obviously, and, and all of them. So, you know, pr pretty much the, the, the classics, the, the big hitters, the heavy hitters. Um, you know, one of the like one of the first articles you published on Training Peaks uh, was about the the new ways of testing FTP, and then the podcast kind of started with a series of uh, episodes on FTP. Um, and and I know that one of the conversations I routinely have with athletes is about like trying to alter their understanding of of FTP. Um, I've got as always, I have like multiple questions wrapped into one. Um, <laughs> The first one is, um, could you tell us a little bit about about that alternate method of testing that you published on Training Peaks, um, and how how you developed it, um, and then also like ways that you talk with your athletes about FTP. It's kind of a three parter there. Okay, what was the first one? Let's start there. First part is how did you yeah talk to it? Tell it like walk us through that FT that that protocol that you have for finding FTP. And I I for know sure. that you know uh, you said on the podcast like you're like well actually I don't really use that too often because a lot of times I already have the data from races or whatnot. Um, but that was a really good starting point protocol, and we've used it for some of our athletes. Um, so just how did that? How did you decide upon it? Oh, I actually don't remember, honestly. Um, yeah, I think, I forget if I did it. I think, I forget if I did it first or I had one of my athletes do it first. Um, where I think I, I like snuck in because, you know, at the time I was, um, I was, you know, just discovering kind of the mechanism of FTP workouts and, you know, lengthening them and, mm -hmm. you know, how that affected everything. And so I was giving people long intervals and longer intervals and you know we would do like you know typical like three by 15 you know three by 20 blah 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 two by 30 and then i was like i think i can sneak in a long interval and have it actually be a test and i i so i think i think i did that to somebody else first um usually i i experiment myself first but uh in this case i don't think i did because it was just you know so what if it's just an interval um and then later I had a couple of people come up to me because I think I was coaching at MIT at the time. I had some people come up to me like, did you sneak in an FTP test <laughs> on us? Like a long one. And I, cause I was scared to, like, I really was. Cause uh, when I was just starting to train, uh, my coach at the time was like 20 minute test. Don't go longer. Or you're going to screw yourself up for a week. Like hmm. you're, or, or longer. Like it's going to take you so long to recover from a 40 K time trial. And I was like, Oh God. Oh, I, I can't ever do that to anybody. And then, and I was like, but intervals are, nobody's dead from like a two by 30 FTP, unless it's set really wrong. And, and so, yeah, so that's, that's how it developed was just sneaking it in. And because, you know, because I had WK04, uh, you know, I, and, you know, you see the whole smooth, uh, well, smooth, um, you know, power curve. I was like, oh yeah, like FTP is right there. It's just this inflection point. And so I just, I just endeavored to get people to get to that inflection point and that was it. So the protocol is really just starting a little under that uh, because your body does take a little time to warm up. And actually one of the biggest things in cycling and exercise physiology stuff, it, like testing in general is the warmups are not long enough. Like if you do like a ramp test, your, if your warm up is like, five minutes at 50 watts or 100 watts and you start there and then and like from like dead fresh like that's going to affect you know rer and it's going to affect lactate and stuff like that so a good log warm-up start a little easy and then you know it, you know what's funny is in in the article i actually didn't um at the time 
or I did at the time use some of those, uh, the progressions with some athletes, but for the most part, I just bring everybody right to the last one of like, start a little low and then just ramp it up until you feel that threshold and just, just peg it there and just go until you crack. And, you know, that's really good early season, especially, um, or after a layoff when there's no maximal data and you're not really sure where somebody's legs are, but, uh, after, you know, some racing and testing and, um, you know, sometimes I'll just tell somebody like, go give me a 15 to 35 minute time trial. Sometimes that's enough to like, and then, you know, we can just move, use the model, but it depends on, you know, where the athlete's at. And if, if I think they've hit a rut with the FTP stuff, that's uh, in the last, the second FTP testing <laughs> episode, we talked about people hitting a rut and relying on the model a little more. So there's a lot of ways to approach it, but you're really looking for just that inflection point of above this point, you're going to fatigue faster below this point, you fatigue slower. That's, that's the whole thing. That is MLSS. That's, that's FTP, lactate threshold, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So what you're, what you're kind of finding there is that you're really nailing down that time to exhaustion metric. Yeah. You, um, that's a that, very, very important one. Yeah. Cause like it's, cause that's where they, that's, that tends to be where the fall off happens. Like, right. At, like not long after they hit that FTP number. Yeah. And I've actually had some interesting discussions with athletes of like, oh, I wasn't really at a 10 out of 10. And I'm like, you know, whether it's like 60 minutes or 63 minutes, like <laughs> it's the same difference. It's not 30 minutes and it's not 80 minutes. Like that's, that's one of the big differences. I think it's possible that some of the folks in, um, in the audience or listening right now, maybe heard you say um, two by 30 at FTP isn't going to kill anyone and possibly had a, a pretty physical reaction to that. <laughs> um, can you maybe address some of the misunderstandings about how hard FTP should feel? <laughs> oh, yeah. FTP should feel like, um, actually, I, I, I didn't even come up with this. Uh, I, um, it was somebody Hunter Allen knows, uh, discomfortable is how FTP should feel. Um, so, like, during a test, uh, I usually describe it uh, and you know, using this description, like 95% of the time, people will absolutely nail it on the first try, even if they're like, not that experienced with long intervals or anything like that, where you're riding. And if you ride a little harder, you realize that your legs are not long for this world. But if you like bring it just a little down, and you go, man, I can suffer like this for a while. And you go, Oh, I have to suffer like this for a while. <laughs> like that's, that's right where you should be. Um, and, you know, and when you describe it to somebody like that, like, for instance, um, you know, one of my athletes after a long, excellent season of, uh, uh, of, 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 you know, winter endurance training, uh, he, you know, his FTP had been like 330 watts for like 40 minutes or something like that. Um, and then after all that, uh, it was 80 minutes. He, he went for 80 minutes at 330. And I was like, all right, just to confirm this, we're going to do, you know, I'm going to make you ride at 345, 350 Watts. And he, he could only make it like 20 or 25 minutes or something like that. Interesting. Um, and I was like, yeah, so that's the, that's that point where like just above that he fatigued a lot faster. And just below that, like, it's like, Oh, your sweet spot intervals are going to be like, <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> so we actually had to bump his FTP up to, to get the intervals into a reasonable range. Um, I think get discomfortable with discomfort is the new endurance school t-shirt at this point. Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have to find out what uh, discomfortable translates to in Latin. <laughs> um, so like uh, uh, one of the things that we were really stoked to, to listen to is in one of the podcasts, you talk about um, uh, like pacing an endurance ride eventually through RPE, you know, yeah. like, should we use heart rate? Should we use power? yes to both but really like rpe is the thing that would get you there um and that's kind of what you just described with with the ftp figuring that out is that it should really feel this certain way um sometimes getting athletes to like believe you or understand <laughs> like what different levels of, in of intensity should feel like um how do you communicate that concept to your athletes i mean i i just um, I just tell them like, look, uh, you know, especially when we start working together, uh, if they're very numbers focused, um, and they're very much a student of the, the old school 
uh, method. Um, you know, cause I used to be like that too. I know where they're coming from. I used to think, you know, endurance rides had to be in this range. And if I just do peg it like right at the top of zone two, before I hit zone three, like 10 Watts below, like I'm going to, man, this is going to be a better endurance workout than if I just went a little lower and, you know, a lot longer and I'm actually the opposites probably <laughs> true. <laughs> um, yeah, I just tell them. Um, and I, and I think also, uh, you know, one of the things that I do, I don't know if you all do it, but I write every workout by hand. Um, I, I type every workout out every single week for everybody, uh, which gets a little tedious sometimes, obviously. Um, but, you know, I, but I, but it allows me to like go into my notes file for that athlete and go, okay, this is what this person's working on and look at the comments from the last couple of weeks and kind of triangulate them where they're at and where their head's at. And then I can use that to, you know, maybe use some different cues about how things should feel when they're riding. Um, and, you know, that, that can help a lot of the time. So like endurance riding, especially, I, I always tell people like, you should feel like you're working, but not like you're working, working. Like you, you should be able to do it all day. Not a problem. You might have to eat. You've got to drink. Sure. But you've, you really should feel very comfortable with that. Um, and, you know, I've, I can't really do much endurance riding myself anymore these days. Uh, but, you know, on the odd chance that I do go, oh, I could, I think I can stand an hour without dying. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I can find it right away because I know what it feels like. And um, yeah, and I, I think once people get attuned to that and get kind of get the numbers out of their head, it gets a lot easier because, you know, for a lot of people, their all day endurance pace is like 80% of FTP. It's not like, it's not 60%. It's not 68%. It's like, it's like 70, 78 to 80% of FTP and they can really do it for like eight hours. Um, but it, some people it's like, you know, 60%, 65%. Um, and it's up to you to find that. But when you start going over that threshold, the, you know, metabolically, it starts to change a little bit and you want to avoid that because you can get a lot more adaptation by just riding a little under that threshold. Um, actually, it actually is a threshold. Like it's, it's LT one yeah. and you can, you can find it by feel. Um, and it's different for everybody, uh, you know, where it is relative to FTP and VO2 max. So, um, so, and, and it changes with fatigue and with sleep and hydration and diet and, you know, all sorts of things. So it's, it's best that, you know, a person kind of sorts it out on the day and it's going to change through the ride. Um, you know, uh, one of my athletes, he, he got a lactate meter, uh, recently, and he's been doing a lot of testing and, you know, his LT one changes through a ride. Like, you know, it's only like 10 or 15 or 20 Watts, but like, you know, he'll, he'll start out at, you know, 220 and he'll end a ride at like 245. He's taking lactate samples on his bike ride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I tell him just, just, you know, stop, um, you know, get, get your thing done and, uh, just and continue. And, you know, your, your body's not going to like chew through that lactate Im immediately. Um, unless you've just done a really hard effort. Uh, mm -hmm. so it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, you can, you can do that. Nice. I, I, I don't recommend it. I mean, <laughs> it, I mean, it can also drive you nuts, you know, uh, analysis by paralysis and, or vice versa, or whatever, <laughs> whatever that phrase is. And, you know, over analysis of everything, like it's, it's just, it's super simple to just sort it out yourself on the day, like when you're doing it. Yeah. I mean, I, we love that because like, yeah, there's so many numbers and conditions, you know, that like it's, you're, it, you're as a coach, you're so at a loss to be like, it's this number. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, like, I, can't I can't tell you it's that number. Yeah. yeah you're hundred percent right. right. And, and I, I've got a couple athletes where they're like, man, this is so boring. Like, and, you know, it, it, you know, cause they're indoors and stuff and they're on the mm -hmm. trainers and they're on Zwift and, it's just, it's not exciting enough. And I get that. And, you know, we do a couple things here and there to like make it a little less boring, like some leg speed stuff and some, and we play with the cadence and stuff, but you know, it, it does get boring. And they're like, can I just really please just set 180 Watts and just leave it there. And I'm like, okay, but it's, you promise, if you feel like you're working, you're going to bring it down. <laughs> and, uh, and they promise. And, and a lot of times I'll see that, like that stair step of like, man, am I here today? Am I here today? Um, and, but starting too hard is, is a problem. So you never want to start too hard. That's, that's something I advised everybody. If they're going to like erg mode, it just start 
30 watts easier than you think you need to <laughs> then adjust up to it if you start over like you start digging a hole right away that's smart i like that um so we have a question from chat that uh, i want to get to and also for other folks who are out there feel free to feel free to drop questions into chat Sure. Um, but somebody wants to know a little bit about your, your workout planning process. And I know you said you write them all by hand. Um, what workouts do you save, if any, to the workout library? Um, he's especially, con or he or she, I'm not sure who this is, um, is especially uh, interested in the VO2 max workouts, um, which are different from how most people approach them. Yeah, none. I don't, I've, I, I mean, I have, I started doing that a long time ago, but I, I, I immediately stopped because I, I, I kept having to like go in and like rewrite everything anyway. Um, you know, with VO2 max workouts, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's different to coach those than it is to coach anything else because some people will do really well with the longer efforts. Not everybody. Most people don't actually, most people like the really short ones. Um, and, you know, I try to mix it up because, you know, as the fatigue goes on, like through, a, uh, you know, doing more VO2 max training, cause I try to get somebody to do a lot of VO2 max training at once and, you know, just get all that adaptation, then we can really focus on the other stuff. Because, you know, the fatigue is different when you're working different things. So be it to max fatigue is different from like sprint fatigue is different from endurance fatigue. Uh, so, you know, just to keep everything nice and simple, I uh, try to block it off like that. Um, it, you know, we don't always obviously, but some people that doesn't work. But, for, you know, for the most part, I try to and so like doing via to max stuff, you know, we'll start with like, you know, I would, you know, sometimes I'll like, I'll even let people like get, uh, get crazy. Like, all right, you can do as many of these intervals as you want, but as soon as your legs are empty, you stop and then you get off the bike and you eat something and say, okay. Uh, and usually mo nobody gets past like 24 minutes or something like that. <laughs> so like, so, so we usually shoot for like, like 15 to 20 minutes of really good hard interval time. Um, and some people are, you know, some type of, some people it's like we got to like adjust the cadence right or we've got to adjust the rest intervals right or you know they're not resting long enough we got to talk about that um you know there's a, there's a thousand different things that can happen with an athlete and it's very individual um you know there there is a middle ground that you know probably half of people it works fine for but you know the other half you know we really have to adjust uh at you know as we go um and so i and so i, I just write workouts week to week like i plan i schedule a week next week the next week some people need a couple of weeks as they're like nutritionist needs to know stuff, things like that. Um, but, you know, for the most part, that's what we do because it gives us the most amount of flexibility while I'm also like always looking down the calendar to make sure that we're not going to, you know, we're always on target for our long-term goals too. But not that there was any of the, that this year, really. <laughs> this year it was just train until you're tired and then take some time off. <laughs> Um, that kind of, that, that sort of, uh, heads straight into the next question I had, which is what are your signs that an athlete does need some time off, like, or, or, uh, like some recovery? Oh, I mean, that's, you know, I'm sure that's the same thing that, you know, you look for. It's just, you know, the, the emojis, a lot of frowny <laughs> faces, uh, <laughs> or, you know, the disconnect between the, the emoji and the RPE. Like if somebody's emoji is like, um, you know, frowny face but the rp is like three it's like uh oh what happened here um but uh yeah like it's comments uh it's looking at the power data looking at trends in the data like like heart rate when somebody's really really fit and heart rate typically doesn't decouple that much if it decouples a lot it's like are you okay did you eat did you sleep um then you start you know asking these questions and a lot of the time like my my athletes know me by now and when they have a bad workout sleep was fine. I'm a little stressed. Um, maybe I should have bailed. Like they, they know the questions that are coming. Um, but yeah, it's not just like one thing. It's, it's like a couple, it's a bunch of things and, you know, you kind of put them all on the scale or I don't, I don't know what the right metaphor is, but um, you know, they all pull the levers a little bit and then you kind of figure out what does this person need? And, you know, nine times out of 10, it's rest very, very infrequently is are things going badly and it needs more training. So, yeah, so usually, it's, uh, yeah, I, I would say if, if anybody wants like a rule of thumb, like two workouts in a row that don't go well, mm -hmm. then it's probably time to take a rest. I'm very happy you just said that last part. That rest, <laughs> that, that rest is very often the thing. All of, most, tri most triathletes really need to hear that. I mean, actually, you know, it's funny because um, 
uh, one of, um, I won't say who, because I don't want to throw any triathletes they've worked with under the bus. Uh, but one of those people that I had mentioned previously when talking about coaching triathletes um, said, you know, one of the things about triathletes is that they have a hard time getting faster because they're always going just kind of hard, but not hard enough or easy enough to really adapt. Um, and so I, 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 I've coached a triathlete. I coached one duathlete before, um, but I, I've actually moved away from coaching multi-sport because there's just so many regular cyclists to coach and that's a whole nother dimension of things. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it up to you two to tell me <laughs> whether that, that stereotype is true or not. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, actually, go for it, Mom. No, no. I, would, I would really like to know what, um, what you see as the biggest difference between coaching multi-sport mm. athletes and, and cyclists. I mean, because, well, when I'm coaching them, I, I mean, there's really not that many differences. Um, you know, it's just they, they do the workouts and that's that. <laughs> um, I mean, the pacing is a little different because, you know, like a competitive road cyclist time trial, like it can be like a 25 minute, you know, uphill time trial, like Joe Martin or something like that. And that's different to coach than, you know, like a, you know, Olympic distance duathlon. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's pacing, but, you know, the physiology is the same you know, I'll, I'll give people slightly different workouts, you know, cause, but you know, in triathlon, you're under threshold a lot, like, you know, all the time, unless you're, you know, doing one of those weird Philly things where you're just climbing all those hills. <laughs> that would be a triathlon. Road cyclists would be <laughs> competitive. Road cyclists would be good at, except for the running part. Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That is, uh, that, that is the struggle for, yeah. The cyclists that I know <laughs> they're like running. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're going to be terrible at eccentric contractions. This is going to be awful. <laughs> like yes. you're going to be sore for a year. Um, uh, so we have a few more questions in chat. Um, so about decoupling. Um, so what do you look for in the decoupling? Is it, and the question, so I'm just going to read the question. Uh, do you ascribe to the quote, let's do endurance until your decoupling is blank and then move on to the other zones. Um, so asking what's the, uh, what's the, I think the question is what's the threshold for decision-making there with endurance. There's not a threshold. Um, no, I mean, if somebody's, you know, over a five hour ride, like early season, like it's happening with a lot of folks. Um, like if you like, like for instance, uh, like, uh, one of the guys I coach, he's just coming off two weeks, uh, you know, almost entirely off the bike and uh, his first couple endurance rides, like two hours, you know, he's a significant amount of decoupling. Mm -hmm. But the thing is like, you wouldn't want, he didn't want to go longer than that anyway. And I wouldn't want him to go longer than that. Um, and so that's like a natural stopping point. Um, and so it's not because there's decoupling it's because that's the amount of time that's reasonable right now. Uh, you know, despite that he can ride as much as we want him to two hours is enough right now. Um, and the decoupling is an artifact of that, but it's not like, it's not a decision maker. Uh, if for instance, somebody's in fairly good shape and they're used to do, like doing five hour rides and, you know, we always see like five or 10% decoupling based on like the heat and the fatigue and the diet and blah, 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 you know, then it's like, okay, well, that's some decoupling, but um, you know, over the long term, you want to see that decoupling go down. Um, but you know, at, you know, as summer comes on, sometimes it doesn't, and you've got to like kind of weigh these these factors. But it's not it's not really a decision maker. Usually, like like with a sweet spot workout or something like that, if there's a a lot of decoupling um, that I'm not used to seeing in somebody, you know, my first question is like, are you feeling okay? Are you tired? Um, and nine times out of ten, they'll say yes, or like the heart rate will change. Like interval two, it'll be higher. Interval three, it'll be lower. And I'll be like you feeling better in interval three? And they'll be like, yes, I was. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we have yeah. one more question in chat. Um, so this person is wondering uh, why you should be using RPE and is the reason due to the size principle? And if so, then are you supposed to back it off when you feel you're pushing too hard to stay within the suggested RPE? And does that mean that this is not fatiguing any additional motor units or is that the goal? And if the answer is you should listen to this specific podcast, they say that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So does that have to do with the size principle? Uh, no. Um, you know, I mean, decoupling can happen for a lot of reasons. And once you kind of eliminate all the other reasons, then yeah, it's definitely from, you know, recruiting larger motor units. But, you know, that depends on like how much like fast twitch and slow twitch fiber you have. If you're, 
like 80 90 percent slow twitch and you're doing an endurance ride that uh, you're not going to be touching your slow twitch or your fast twitch fibers um you're you know and even if you are experiencing the uh you know getting into larger motor units you know they're going to be just as efficient as the ones that you that you were initially using and so you're not going to see any of that increased o2 requirement needed to you know put out the same amount of power um because it's really just the efficiency thing with you know so, somebody like me like i'll see decoupling in like you know an hour endurance ride because <laughs> i'm like <laughs> i'm like 80 percent fast twitch fiber at this point um so yeah it doesn't have anything to do with it really um yeah you should you should always just keep it to the rpe because um you know because because once you start going over like especially with endurance rides once you start going over that um what happens is you are actually starting to really dig into your carbohydrate stores and that's gonna you know cause some decoupling and you know if that's where it's like you know especially for triathlon a lot of distances like you you're gonna be in that zone you know where you know your race distance is going to put you over your all-day endurance pace and but it's going to be like below like ftp and you've got to like figure out you know how to pace that and that's a that's another workout in itself that's not like an endurance training workout that's like a you know like a race pace like we got to figure out how to like you know get your brain to gauge how hard you need to go based on how far you've gone and you know like that like that's another like rpe skill in itself um, we definitely have to like, let you go soon. Cause, uh, you know, I know it's, uh, it's nine o'clock on the East coast and also, you know, like, uh, we have to, we have to cut it off at some point. But, um, one of the things I found amazing about your company is the book list on the empirical cycling library. Oh, sure. Um, I opened up that link and I was like, you know, and then you like scroll down and you're like, oh my God. Um, so a lot of the titles on there, I think a lot of our listeners will be familiar with like Roar is on there, um, Jack Daniels running. Um, then there are some on there uh, like um, uh, Power, Sex, and Suicide. Um, yeah, that's right here. Nice. <laughs> um, and then the one that I was like that I was that I was most sort of like intrigued by an introduction to error analysis, um, and uh, it's oh, yeah. just such That's a over right here it's it's over on that shelf yeah um oh well that was that was one of those things where like i i got that because i was going to take an extremely advanced physics course and i just ended up you know kind of flipping through that book and i was like i like this book i kind of understand error analysis a little better now you know i didn't do all the problems in it but i understand i understand but it got me to understand like error propagation and things like that I was like, oh, maybe, you know, this helped me. It might help somebody else. How, how did it show up in your, in your coaching? Um, just by, um, you know, every, every time uh, I do modeling of something, uh, there's always error. Like, um, and the more things that you make assumptions on, the larger that error stacks up and the less accurate your final thing is going to be. And so you always have to keep it really simple and think, you know, like, what is the bare minimum number of assumptions that I can make before I can really say for sure what's happening. And, you know, even in like power analysis, you know, it's very, <laughs> you know, a lot of assumptions have to be made. And so a lot of the time you can't really say anything too definitive. Um, and, you know, one of the, one of the people I coach, uh, she's a math PhD and she has some very, very incisive questions for me. <laughs> and so, and she's like, you can't really know this. And I'm like, I know, I know, <laughs> but this is the best we got. That sounds so fun. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we could stay, we could stay here and ask you questions all night, but, um, but as I, Chris I'm, said, you're... <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm actually wide awake, um, which is unusual for me. So if, if you got more questions for me, I'm, uh, I, I have some time. I think we're, we're through the ones in chat. Um, we haven't gotten to meet your cats yet, which I know was one of the big asks that. Oh yeah. The, they're the they're actually out in the hallway but... sleeping right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ooh, uh, I want, I want you to, to break some more of our triathletes hearts and, um, oh, God. <laughs> and I'm sorry, so, everybody. <laughs> um, so, uh, so erg mode, <laughs> okay. uh, beloved by triathletes. Um, but sometimes not always like, um, not always incredibly helpful. I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about why erg mode can like let, let us down as athletes. Um, I find erg mode to be like the ultimate manifestation of 
x watts equals y adaptations um and that's really not at all the case and so if you th like a lot of the time especially with like over threshold work mm. <clears throat> excuse me like a lot of people will go oh this is my vo2 max power but if that were really true you would be able to like do a minute there and five minutes rest and a minute there and five minutes rest and you could accumulate a hundred minutes of that in a couple days you know without that much fatigue but you're really not working via to max you've got to think about what's happening underneath like and i've got an eight hour series on that <laughs> yeah, exactly. um um yeah but erg mode is, is like i think it's like the ultimate manifestation of that because it it really says like the numbers are static and they're not like you know, lt1 can vary a lot in a ride um and so you always want to ride to rpe for for things like that and like threshold like like threat like things like threshold like fortunately for that like they don't change that much so if somebody wants to do like a sweet spot workout or an ftp workout with erg mode i think that's okay i'd prefer they don't because you need to get used to like pacing yourself and having to maintain that and having to ha have that focus you know especially in triathlon where you know it's just you and the road you know sometimes you got other people around but like it's just i just have to pedal how long am I, do i have to pedal like uh what's my distance oh god i have to do this for another like four hours <laughs> um you know learning that mental focus um can take a lot but at some points i mean yeah like you need it you need to like have that mental break like like with mountain bikers you know in the week three four of a really hard build cycle you know sometimes i got to put them on the road bike because they're too tired to ride off road and you know if they hit this technical second or single track like they're gonna get hurt um because mentally they're just tired but you know they can do a little more so you know that's one of those things where it's useful on occasion but i think it's better to always be calibrating your brain and getting really good at that because at some point you're not like your brain's going to be the all, only the uh, your brain's going to be the only erg mode you need you're going to tell your brains do this and your brain's going to go got it <laughs> You are keeping us in t-shirts over here with your, yeah. <laughs> your brain is the only erg mode you need. Um, and the last <laughs> question from Jad, um, do you have your athletes do single leg drills? Um, and are your, or are your cadence and drills, um, more specific than that? Some research shows that pulling up on the pedal might actually be less efficient. So if you do these drills, is there a different reason why? Um, I do, especially for track athletes because on the track when you know you're on 92 96 inches in a you know like a cat two cat three bunch race that you know may or may not be going that fast well that's another <laughs> gearing is another thing altogether there but like you can typically expect to be sprinting at like 140 to 150 160 rpm um and that's something that you have to get used to um and so having that neuromuscular coordination of knowing when to like turn on and off your muscles and also having that practice uh, matters a lot too, because, you know, rapid contraction and relaxation is a slightly different version of adaptation than just like, you know, pedaling at 90 RPM at FTP. Like it's, there are different things happening there. Like there's different glycogen stores and things like that. And, you know, you're training your sarcoplasmic reticulum and, you know, neurally in the whole signal transduction pathway like that, that gets better. Um, but, um, you know, but for the the pulling up on the pedal thing and stuff like that, like, I mean, I, you know, I actually do have people do single leg pedal drills sometimes, but only as like a primer, uh, because I find it makes the high cadence stuff a little better. Because, um, you know, now you're engaged into that full circle thing. And when you're trying to like turn everything on and off, it really makes you think. But when you've got two legs in there, it's it's a lot different because, you know, when one leg's generating power, it's like, you know, the other leg may or may not need to be pulling up. And, you know, the body finds, um, you know, low energy troughs wherever it can, you know, like when you hurt your ankle and you spend that the first like five minutes, like trying to figure out the right way to walk, because if I walk this way, oh, that's, like, it doesn't hurt, but I'm really tired. Like, this is not efficient. And you try a couple different things. And then by then it's like, you're better. <laughs> you just walk normally again, but that's what your brain is doing. And that's what you're doing when you are doing pedaling stuff. Um, so it's really important for, uh, for track cyclists, I think anybody who's going to pedal fast. Um, but you know, for average cyclists, uh, it's, 
I would say it's probably not as important as you think. Um, I think being able to pedal fast and be and be smooth helps a lot, especially when you get really tired, because um, then you're not you're not like clamping down on your muscles and trying to keep them tense. You know how to relax them and spin them. Um, but um, yeah, but uh, you know, pulling up actually is is really really important for sprinters. Uh, you can actually add a lot more watts, like um, like ten to twenty percent more power in a sprint by pulling up really hard, but you're also going to like risk pulling your foot straight out of your pedal. So you've got to make sure you're set up for that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, but mostly just doing a lot of pedaling and do, doing some pedaling, like a little faster than you're used to, that might be all you really need to, to, you know, work on the, the, your own pedaling and getting comfortable there. Did I think I answered it? I'm not sure. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, well, Coley, this was awesome. This was like a real, uh, this is a real treat, uh, for me, especially, um, I've been, uh, I've been devouring your podcast for a while now. Um, and, uh, uh I think some of my athletes are probably not so happy that I discovered <laughs> some of the things that you prescribed. Um, but I did do, I, I made, I, I, I tried out the high cadence VO2 max intervals myself first. So, uh, they're rough, aren't they? They are terrible <laughs> they are they um, were they were like the first workout i ever actually really really did like the first interval workouts i ever did because somebody got me for christmas um a uh, carmichael training video where where dean gullich was there giving people 120 rpm three minute all out and i had to stop like a minute in because i'd never breathed that hard in my life before or since <laughs> and uh and i was like wow, this sucks. Uh, I think I'm not going to do this ever again. I put it aside. <laughs> and then later after I knew Dean a little bit, I was like, and he was talking to me about these. I was like, oh yeah. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're insanely hard. I mean, I started at like uh, four by two or five by two and was like, oh, geez, this is, uh, this is, and yeah, the breathing, the breathing is the alarming part. Yes. Yeah. You really, really feel like you're drowning. Yeah. Um, and, you know, actually, I, I have people do like special prep for those intervals too. like, we'll do high cadence, like, like, uh, anaerobic capacity workouts to prep, mm. like 30 seconds all out at like 130 to 140 RPM, um, stuff like that can, can help a little bit, but, you know, probably not, not going to be, you know, welcomed by many triathletes, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but like, if, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, every triathlete is still going to benefit from an improved, you know, aerobic capacity. So it's oh, yeah, like, you know, definitely. it's like, it's like, well, like let's, let's, cause I think what you were saying earlier about triathletes is right. Like they all end up in the messy middle. Like they sort of end <laughs> messy up middle, in that, that's great. <laughs> like that spot where they're not, and you see this with triathletes, like, like over a three-year period, when they take up the sport, they get a lot better, and then they stop because they've just they they don't they don't stress the system beyond what they've kind of just just by riding their bikes at middle intensities is going to do for them. Yeah, and you know it's funny because a lot of studies will say you know like endurance riding will improve your VO two max, and it will to a point. Um, like for instance, I uh, I worked with a guy for a little bit. He had, he's a doctor. He had to go you know, treat a pandemic or something. Uh, so he's not training at the moment, but for a little bit, like he was like, man, I think I'm at my, my genetic max or something like that. And, and I was like, you know, well, we'll see where we can get you. Um, and, uh, you know, he did some via to max training, and, you know, after like years and years and years of like really good endurance training and some okay FTP training, but he'd never really done via to max training. And, you know, immediately he had like 15, 20 more Watts than he thought possible. Actually, maybe it was 25. Um, and he went to a time trial, like not, not long after that, where he was like, I, I underdid this. And I was like, what do you mean? He, uh, I looked at the power file and it's like, it's like steady, 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 steady. In the last two minutes, it's like <laughs> up like 90 Watts or something like that. And I was like, what happened? He goes, I didn't believe the number that I was seeing and I, that I, or that I could do it. Um, and so I underpaced it by a lot and I, I can't believe how much I've improved in like just a couple months. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and you know, that, that kind of thing shows that like, you know, some people, yes, like some people will, you know, be able to always improve their VO2 max by doing a lot of endurance training, but not everybody. And in fact, most people probably cannot, and I, I don't mean numbers to back this up. This is just in my experience. 
but um, you know, but if you're kind of at, you know, at that point where, oh, my FTP is not really going up, that's, you really need to do some dedicated VO2 max work, even, even triathletes, mm-hmm. um, you know, cause I, you know, I'll be getting to this into the, probably getting to this in the next series, but like, you know, doing FTP training at a certain point will move your FTP out, but it's probably not going to move it up. And the same goes for like endurance training and stuff like that. Awesome. Well, we're gonna we're gonna call it there, um, and uh, you know, uh, we're, you're getting you're getting uh, some love in chat. Um, oh, thank uh, you, everybody. I, can, I cannot that, see the chat, so I'll I'll have to believe you. They could be yeah. saying like, "I hate these intervals." <laughs> there might uh, be a little one. bit of both. <laughs> uh, uh, JP Lucas fourteen says, "I could ask questions to Coley all day. Love the stuff you put out." So, oh, just uh, yeah you know, email me or like follow me on Instagram at empirical cycling. And uh, every weekend I do an AMA in the stories. Um, and uh, you can ask your questions there or just email me uh, for a consult. Uh, I'm around. Um, so yeah, uh, everyone listen to the podcast. Um, go find Coley at empirical cycling um, on uh, Instagram and uh, at empirical Cy- uh, empirical cycling at gmail.com. Right. Um, and um, yeah, thanks again so much for coming on. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm, I was flattered to be invited to do something like this. Um, and uh, yeah, Chris Molly, thank you so much. It we will have you back. amount of fun for us. <laughs> yeah, I'll be here. Yeah, this was fun. Soon, right. Um, to everybody out there, if you're new to the Endurance School, um, please consider following us by clicking on the little heart emoji up on the upper right-hand corner. And um, for those of you who are familiar with our schedule, you will already know, but please come back and join us for Yoga with Amy VT tomorrow at 7.30 a.m. PST. Um, And we will see you all again soon. Coley, thank you again. Here is to a happier and faster tomorrow. Bye, guys.